hymn 189. Hymn 189, O come all ye faithful, please stand. We'll sing all three verses. <clears throat> third verse. pray. Father, we do thank you that we can come before you today. Lord, I pray for everyone that's here today, including myself, Lord. Uh, we've had a lot of preparation and praise for you, and Lord, I pray it would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, help us as we come to you today to see you as the king, the king of all the universe, who came to dwell among us. And Lord, help us to see your glory today. Um, Lord, too many people will just miss that this Christmas season. Help it not to be us. Lord, we thank you for putting us in a nation where we could hear the gospel, where we could hear it, be saved, and Lord, also be free to worship you. Lord, thank you for that. Help us to trust you this day. Help us as we leave this place and we minister to our families and friends throughout the next couple of days. Help us to have that gospel upon our lips of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. It's good to see everyone here. And um, it's just a blessing to have everyone here. This sea of red as I look out over it. Praise the Lord for that. The, um, uh, we will try to keep things moving today the best that we can. So why don't we um, have our, our memory verse. You can turn your bulletin. It's John, Gospel of John 1.14. You can see it in your bulletin. It's in the Gospel of John 
1.14. And let's say that together, starting with the reference. Ready? John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Tim? In the way of announcements this morning, um, again, the ladies' Bible study will be in recess till after the first of the year. Um, January 2nd, uh, wasn't, we didn't get to put that in last week. Actually, we weren't here last week, were we? We, were we weren't here last week. The Home Builder Sunday School class and the teen class are going to go bowling at the Machina Valley Super Bowl in Phillipsburg. It's $20 a person, $20 per family or $5 a person. And there's a sign-up sheet out in the fellowship hall. So if you're interested, it's any of the teens or uh, young Mary... Sign up out there. It's going to be a good time. Uh, and a couple other ones. The teen group will meet on Monday, December 23rd. That will be tomorrow. From 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., we'll be making and delivering Christmas ornaments as an outreach project, and pizza will be provided. That's right here at the church. So 11 a.m. tomorrow morning for the teens. And also, if you can't be here for Christmas Eve service and you'd like to take your poinsettia so it doesn't wilt, you can do that after the service today. But if if you're going to be here Christmas Eve, then we'd like you to leave it and take it Christmas Eve. With that, gentlemen. Mom, would you pray for the offering, please? Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day today. We thank you for the assembly we have here that we can come to sing praises and worship your son, the King. And we just pray now, Father, for this time of the service that we can give back to you portions of what you've given to us. We thank you for the abundance. We just pray that it will be used to bring honor and glory to you and further your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. As we continue this morning, we'll turn to hymn 197, 197, born in a manger, sing all three verses, 197, you may remain seated.
on the last verse. This time, Brother Dave Brown will come with a scripture reading. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading, if you'll turn there in your Bibles, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 2, 1 through 12, and please rise if you're able as we read from God's Word. <coughs> Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he <laughs> demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, and they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Here into this reading, may we be blessed in having shared in it. You may be seated. As we continue our service of worship, we'll have special music from the choir. Yeah. 
you to go back with us to that first very still Christmas Eve, the night of the birth of the Savior of the world. No sounds but the stirring of animals in the stalls, the creaking of boards in the stable, the smell of animals and of hay and feed, the warmth of a young mother cuddling her newborn baby close. Any young couple with a newborn feels a special closeness and an overwhelming feeling of love and protection for that little baby. Imagine the even greater responsibility that young couple must have felt knowing that they had been entrusted with the care of the Son of God. In Matthew 1, 20 and 21, we are told that the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Mary, too, received a visit from an angel. The scriptures tell us in Luke 1, verses 28 and through 35, that the angel Gabriel came in to Mary and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art women out there among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shalt this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And on that holiest of evenings, Mary and Joseph were the first to look upon the face of God in human form, the King of kings in a lowly stable in Bethlehem.
wasn't called Christmas until many years passed, what did that first holy mean to Mary and Joseph? Their memories of that evening were sure to hold feelings of love, warmth, and family. Hopefully, many of your Christmas memories today are the same as those from long ago. The next people to look upon the treasured gift from heaven were the shepherds. They too were visited by heavenly messengers. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 16, we read, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. These scenes show the shepherds gazing at the baby in the manger. But the story of the shepherds doesn't end there. They were the first witnesses of Christ the Lord, the King of glory. Luke 2, 17, 18, and 20 tells us this. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them.
Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Yes, the shepherds shared the story of their Savior born during that first Christmas season. Our Savior is the reason we celebrate the season. Our Christmases can be merry and bright. We need to be like those shepherds from long ago and make known to all the story of our Savior and the true meaning of Christmas. The message of Christmas has become hidden in the materialism of our world today. They have taken out the holy remembrance of the birth of Jesus and replaced it with a season of spending. The very phrase, Merry Christmas, is no longer popular in our society. Instead, we hear happy holidays and season's greetings. As Christians, we know the true meaning of Christmas. We know that Jesus Christ left his throne in heaven to follow an earthly path to the cross. There was no room in the inn for the birth of Jesus. and There is no room given to him today in the world's version of Christmas. This Christmas season, make him the center of your celebrations. Make it known wherever you go that you are celebrating Christ's birth in your home this year. Wish everyone you meet a Merry Christmas and let it show that he lives in your heart.
Amen. Children, you may are dismissed to junior church if you choose. <laughs> You can turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2. That was a special blessing. Thank you, choir. That was, that was wonderful. They get Now, when, Matt, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Let's pray. Father, I ask today that you would help us, Lord, to bow our knee to the true king of the universe, the true king of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for that message that was brought to us in song. I pray now in these uh, brief moments as we look into your word, Lord, I pray you would just drive home uh, in each of our lives, what it means to know you, to worship you, to have that uh, relationship with you uh, that uh, saves us from our sins, Lord, gives us encouragement and joy each and every day, Lord, not just at Christmas, but every day out of the year. Lord, we thank you for your great sacrifice of giving your son to us that we could live. And we praise you for your, your goodness. Lord, help us to install you as our king in our lives now this day. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is something you, you girls don't know too much about, but us men do. Uh, when we were young, I st hope we still don't do this today, but we played a game called King of the Hill. Remember that? Men, remember that? Wasn't that a lot of fun? <laughs> uh, you played Queen of the Hill, or was it Queen of the Kitchen? I don't know what it would be. But we played King of the Hill. And, um, you know, I was... I was the littlest one in the group, okay? I had a neighbor, Willie, and I, I told you about Willie. And Willie was big, okay? He, he, I, when I see the Gamp boy, he reminds me of Willie. He grew, he's big and strong at an early age already. And, and, you know, Willie was that way. And my brother was three years older than me. So I, you know, I had, was at a slight disadvantage. But, you know, being the little boy I was, there's a lot of ways to cheat and uh, do the kinds of things to become king of the hill. And the best time to play king of the hills in the snow, isn't it? That's awesome because you can get away with a whole lot more um, in the snow that you can when it, it's not there. Um, but, you know, life is often, little boys don't grow up, do they? And they continue to play king of the hill. And that's kind of how our leadership is, not just in our country. But if you would look at leadership, I mean, we're only exposed to one, one form here in the United States, but across the whole world. King of the Hill is being played out all the time, isn't it? Unfortunately. Leadership and people and authority in this world seem to always be playing the game of King of the Hill. Attempting to get to the top. Uh, but uh, in, in our society, in, our, in Washington, D.C., the stakes are a lot higher, aren't they? And when you play that game, then us little boys playing it in the backyard. The stakes are higher and lives are at stake. Our story today is a kind of, uh, our Christmas story is kind of like King of the Hill. There's two different, as we look at it, uh, two different uh, people and authorities and two different things going on here. And it's, it's quite a dramatic uh, an event. Uh, it contains two opposing kings and kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of the earth. Herod versus a little child. But in the middle, there's a few wise men who are caught in this game of King of the Hill, this epic struggle. The wise men are kind of like us, right? The wise men needed to make a choice on which king they would submit to. This lesson on submission 
to the true king is a lesson that we must learn this Christmas. And, and I submit to you today that you and I all need to bow to the true king, to the true king. We're going to review the story and the persons in particular very shortly. Uh, as you go through it, David read it. We're not going to look at it in length again. But, uh, you know, as you, we all remember the story. And um, there's some things we have to ask. Who's this Herod? Number one. Herod the Great ruled, uh, lived from 73 B.C. to 4 B.C. And he wasn't a Jew. Yet he ruled over the Jews. His father was an Idumean and his mother was an Arabian. Uh, the Roman Senate had made him king in Judea in around 40 B.C. This is now right around 4 or 5, 6 B.C., probably about 5 B.C. And all, Herod was a great builder and had many uh, accomplishments. Uh, he enlarged the temple, so he, uh, you know, the Jews, from one extent, were uh, uh, thankful that he did that. Uh, and he was an occasionally generous to them. <laughs> if you know Herod... He was anything but generous. And eventually he lost favor with them. His mixed lineage uh, with being an Edomite by blood would have made him unacceptable to the people. Herod became increasingly cruel towards the end of his reign, thinking that his own family was about to overthrow him. He murdered one of his wives, Miriam. Her mother... Two of her sons and his own eldest son, along with many other atrocities which we won't go into. This led the, the Roman Emperor Augustus to comment that it was safer to be Herod's pig, a hus in Greek, than his son, Huos, because he was so cruel. Who were these magi? They were priests, or were they sad, uh, sages from the east? We, we don't exactly know. Well, they could have been king or royalty. We, we're not sure. They were likely from either Persia or Arabia or Babylon area. They were experts in the study of stars. They were astrologers. We don't know the number of them. Many people think it's three because the number of gifts, but we know one thing. There was at least two of them, <laughs> two or more, because it says wise men. How did they come to understand that this was a king? I mean, that's an amazing story just in itself, just in the lives of these three. How did they recognize that this, as they travel some 500 miles, that this is the king of the Jews? Well, the star helped, didn't it? Um, was it a special star for the occasion, or did God prearrange this heavenly event, some people think it was a comet, you know, all kinds of things are offered up. But as you look at the story, it seems to guide them and move. And um, it, uh, it summons them to come and to worship God's Son and provide for his, uh, him and his family. It appears to be a, a lone luminary star. It says his star, singular in verse 2. Matthew chapter 2. Miraculously going before them and leading them, and it draws them to Bethlehem, which the Old Testament scribes knew would be the birthplace of Messiah. He quotes in here Micah 5 chapter 2, that that would be the birthplace of the king. It was not a natural phenomena, but rather a supernatural one. For these skilled astronomers to come in such a long journey it had to be something out of the ordinary. So I would have subscribed to you that this may be possibly, uh, I would go maybe an angel, but more likely the Shekinah glory itself in some kind of form that would lead them to the exact house where the child was. So the events here, as we look, what are the order events? Jesus is born in Bethlehem perhaps a year or so early. The star leaves the Magi as far as Jerusalem and then disappears. Once in Jerusalem, the Magi begin to inquire, where is this Christ child? And they are asking people in the city. Word reaches Herod that the Magi have come to the town seeking for this newborn king of the Jews. 
so that they may worship him. Herod is greatly troubled by this news, and consequently, so is all Jerusalem. And you can imagine, <laughs> our king has come. Herod summons the chief priests and the experts in the law, inquiring of them where the Messiah was to be born. This gathering uh, did not, in my opinion, include the Magi. The religious elite inform Herod the, the, that the M Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and they cite the prophecy of Micah 5 2. Herod then privately summons the Magi, and as he's meeting with them alone, he asks them when the star appeared, thus fixing the birth date of the Holy Child, and therefore his age. Herod then sends the Magi to Bethlehem to find the Messiah, instructing them to return and inform him of the location of this child, so that he location of the child where they come and worship him. So what about you and I? What should we get out of this story? Well, I'm going to say three observations. Three observations that I found about the true king that the wise men led to see. And as we looked at, let's look at the difference between the not-so-good king <laughs> and the true king. This king, he did not use or manipulate his subjects, but rather he gave his life for them. What a difference of a king and a kingdom. Herod and other kings in history, and both in the past and in the present, often have abused their power to strip the people under them of their wealth and their dignity for their own pleasures, their own personal gain. Instead of using their power to serve the people, they use their power to protect themselves and their own interests. Instead of serving the people, they use them. If I could illustrate it, it's kind of like an ancient, what we see here, an ancient, uh, if there was an ancient TV show, uh, let's call it uh, The Apprentice, okay? And the host is Caesar Augustus, <laughs> it's that Donald Trump. And if that was the case, Herod would have won because he is as cruel and ruthless as any man could ever be. This selection process in this world for their kings is quite awful, isn't it? But not God's selection process for his king. This king, the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ, stands in stark contrast to the king of this world. The king whose origins are from everlasting. If we would have read all the way through the Micah 5, 2, it says his comings are from everlasting. This king who came from heaven, he came to minister onto the sub, his, his subjects. He came to give his life in exchange for his subjects so that they could spend eternity with him and with their father in heaven Matthew 20, verse 28 says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. What a difference. No manipulation. Just service. Just ministry. He lived not as a king, Jesus Christ, but as a servant. He gave. He didn't grab power and steal from the people. He gave so that others could live. He gave so that all could live. He gave his life to pay for your sins. You. You. Have you ever considered and received that for your life? You. Not, not the, not, forget the multitudes here today. You. Did you ever receive that in your life? You, have you ever had your life transformed by this king? If you haven't, you need to do that today. <laughs> Secondly, this king did not need to maneuver others into worshiping him. His person and his presence necessitated 
that we worship him. See, Herod is trying everything he can do to get people to worship him. And if they won't, what does he do? He kills them, including his own family members. The one king spends his whole life abusing his power, bullying others with the authority that he was given, while this king, who possesses all authority, all power, humbly controls that power and allows others to recognize that great power, which is contained in his person and his presence. The one king views worship as slaying and ridding himself of all potential rivals, while the other is in complete submission to the will of his father. Wow, what a difference in the king. Other great kings paid homage to him. Uh, if we can quick look at Psalm 72. Um, now we see it here, not with Herod, but with these uh, wise men. And we'll, we've seen it throughout history uh, that it was prophesied that they would pay homage, Gentiles, the Gentiles, to this king. Look at Psalm 72.10. 72.10. The kings of Tarshish of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him, for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. A clear prophecy of the situation we see here with the wise men. Herod stands as a type, though, of all unbelievers who fail to bow in this life. He's not concerned about worshiping, is he? Oh, he, in words he is, but not in his heart. He has no concern to worship this newborn king, but only his selfish agenda. If he truly would have wanted to, he would have took, taken, think of this, this was astounding to me, he would have taken the four and a half mile journey from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see him. Think of that. How many people within four and a half miles of here? It's too much trouble to come to church on a Sunday morning to worship God. Too much of a trouble, too much of a burden. I asked myself why he wouldn't do that. And I think that's the answer to many whys and many people out there as we meet this week and throughout our life. And the answer to that why is because their heart is a million miles away, right? Even in the United States where... We, we can hear a Christmas song. We can, we can hear the word of God all through this season and all throughout the year, but yet people's hearts are a million miles away from God. Isn't that sad? You may be here in this service today. You may be in it. You may go to a good gospel church, uh, you know, like ours, or, you know, if you're here visiting and you go to others, you, you can hear the gospel And hear the truth, but you've never taken that little distance to worship the king. I mean, what is it? For the average person in this assembly today is 30 feet at the invitation to come down and put your knee down there and ask Christ to save you. For 30 feet to bow to the king of the universe. Well, if you don't even want to take that, it's four feet from your standing position to your knees to your face to worship the king. But will you do it? Will you take that step to bow before him? The wise men did, and were greatly blessed because of it. Herod refused to, and now as many others who have refused to bow the knee, he and a great multitude 
will be in hell for eternity apart from the king. Herod was concerned with others worshiping him, (laughs) not him worshiping God. Jesus Christ, though, he doesn't force you to worship him, does he? This day. He doesn't coerce anybody, bend any arms to worshiping him. He just presents his glory like he did to the Magi. He just presents his power and his authority to you this Christmas. And he wants you of your own free will to bow down and worship him because that's the only true and acceptable worship to him. It must be done freely and it must be done fully. True worship cannot be forced, but is freely given from the heart of the one that recognizes the worthiness of this king, Jesus Christ frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, which is a gift of royalty. You gave gold to a king. And they did to the king of kings. They brung incense, which was for divinity, a gift you give to God. You burn and you give to God in worship. And they brought myrrh, which is a funeral gift a gift used for burial, foreshadowing that he would die for the sins of the world. These gifts show amazing insight. God communicated to the wise men that the Messiah would be a king and a God, and God, and that he would come to die. Magnificent story. This occasion also marks the first occurrence that we see in Scripture in the New Testament of Gentiles responding to and accepting revelation concerning the good news of the gospel that the King of Kings has come. And you and I stand here today because of that. Finally, this king left his throne in heaven to ascend to an earthly throne. And it wasn't of gold and silver, was it? Or ivory. He came to a throne that was a cradle. And then a cross. God's ascension of his son as prophesied in the Old Testament took quite a route. But be assured, it will be accomplished. You know, for time's sake, you can read some too. But it speaks of his coronation of his king. And how the heathen rage. Okay, Psalm 2. You can look at it this afternoon. The occasion to this throne for God... Son was down, down, down. Down as low as you can get. And then, from his resurrection and exaltation on, it is up, 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 and then amazingly great above, isn't it? His ascension to his throne. His first coming, which we celebrate at Christmas, he leaves the glories of his throne in heaven in humiliation. Philippians 2, at Christmas time, born in a cradle, a stable, a cave. And then his throne took on the form of a wooden cross where he offered his life in exchange for our sin to purchase us a place in heaven. And then his exaltation, which began through his resurrection and conquering of his enemies and will call him in the second coming to earth to complete submission of all kings all kingdoms, and creation itself. This is quite a king, isn't it? Yes, the true king, the one worthy of your submission and worship, came not to a throne of ivory or gold, but to a manger. This throne was of far greater worth than any ivory throne of mankind. This true king, the one worthy of your submission and worship, chose not a kingdom like the kings of this world, but a cross, a cruel wooden cross, to suffer for his subjects. At his second coming, he shall ascend to the throne of David, as we read this morning, and be king of kings and lord of lords. So don't be confused this Christmas who the true king is. There is only one. 
I know a lot of people, and even in our country, want to be king. But there is only one. The wise men were rightly led by the glory of God to the Christ child. We, too, should end up before his manger, before his cross, and before his glorious throne in heaven. Is this king your king? We're going to close in a little bit in prayer. But ask yourself, is he your king? We sang about it. I preached about it. The Bible speaks greatly about it. But the real answer is, is he your king? Is he your king? Have you ever bowed your knee to him and asked him to forgive you of your sin and turn to him for life everlasting? Have you ever done that? And Christians, those of us that know the Lord, are you in complete submission to this king? If three wise men were, <laughs> why shouldn't we who have trusted him for salvation? Is he installed as your king? He's a king worthy of your time, your talents, and your treasures and your life. He's worthy of that. Is he installed as the king of your life? Or are there competing kings like your sinful pleasures and your desires? Is work become your king? Or other lovers like money? And stuff. All too many people have that as their king. If so, it's time to worship him exclusively again. And you, as you did it today, you trusted him for eternal life. Present him today suitable gifts of praise, gifts not of your wealth, but give him your heart. Give him your life. Can you say to God today, I give you my heart this Christmas? Can you say that? Is Jesus Christ your king? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I don't know everyone's heart today. You do. Lord, we've been blessed with uh, great uh, music that, uh, and song and and the word that focuses on you, the true king, and the word of God. Praise you, Lord, for that. But, Lord, I'm sure, and I know you know, I'm not always sure, but you're always right and know that there are some here today that have never bowed the knee to the true king. Oh, they've come to church. They may come to church for uh, half their life, but they've never bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you there was a day when I was 24 years old where I bowed my knee to the King of Kings and received eternal life. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, as we sing the invitation, it's only a 30-foot walk to ask Jesus Christ to save you. Actually, it's only about 18 inches from your heart, head <laughs> to your heart to ask him to forgive you of your sins and receive eternal life. You can do that in your seat or you can come up here. But I beg you to do it, to do it. Father, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Eric. Oh, we lost Eric. We got Tim. Tim's going to lead us in a closing invitation. And then you're off. Hope to see you this Sunday night, tonight, and Tuesday. It'd be nice to have you out again for a Christmas Eve service. Tim can give you more details on that. Um, but it's at 6 o'clock. Pastor, if you could come back up here for a second. We're going to go back off you. script for a second. Oh. Back here. Just like to take this moment to tell you that uh, you know, we appreciate your efforts, your service, oh, your, uh, your labors to, the, to our church here, which is the, the body and bride of Christ. And to present this uh, gift of love thank and appreciation you. on behalf of the congregation. Again, thank you very much thank for you. your efforts and your your love for us. And Merry Christmas. All right.
Amen. I appreciate all you. Thank you so much as our church family. Okay, as we close today, we'll sing him 180 or 218. I'm sorry, it's still on Christmas. 218. Sing the first and the fourth verses. 218. <laughs> Verse 4. Father God, again, we just praise and thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this Christmas season as we can celebrate his birth, but more importantly, his walk on earth and his death, burial, and resurrection and coming again for us. And we just thank you for reminding us constantly, Lord, that we should keep him first in our lives. And we pray you'll help us in every aspect of our lives to keep you first and to serve you and to seek your will, Lord. And we just thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for all of those that came out today. Pray you'll bring us back this evening and back again Christmas Eve. And Lord, we praise and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs>